Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Beware the Artist. I am Jeremy Jersa, and this week on the show, we have Catherine Kirchie. Uh, Catherine, if you want to tell everybody who you are and what is it that you do. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for having me on the show. I am honored. <laughs> uh, my name is Catherine Kirchie, and I'm an artist from Toronto, Canada. Um, currently, I am specializing in charcoal renderings of landscapes. Um, I consider myself to be a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, when I am not doing my charcoal drawings, I am actually a special effects makeup artist for TV and film. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting balance between the two. Um, yeah, that's the, the best intro introduction I can give for now. <laughs> so um, when it comes to your personal studio practice, what themes do you find yourself exploring? So um, I, I really do uh, focus mostly on uh, an emotional representation of uh, like our environment, specifically with um, our mental state of being. So um, actually at the beginning of COVID is when I really started to specialize on my landscape series specifically. And that was pretty much brought on by um, a moment in time where I wasn't working and I was leaning more towards uh, like natural beauty to be inspired. I was getting out more. I was going for walks, going for hikes, and even uh, looking back on a lot of the trips that I had taken in my life. And a lot of them were to go and see some of, you know, Canada's natural beauty specifically, or even when I was living in Europe. So landscape itself has been something that I've been so inspired by. And I think for me, um, going through COVID, it was just, it was a very stressful time. And I really just wanted to invest all of those emotions in my artwork. And so combining the theme of uh, emotion with uh, natural beauty itself has been my primary focus. Yeah. Did you find yourself when you were younger kind of going out into the landscape, you know, being in Canada, I, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's just multiple things you can do outside. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> did, did you find yourself just kind of exploring that realm and then kind of reconnecting with that through COVID? Yeah, so um, I actually grew up north of Toronto, so I was never actually uh, surrounded by like the urban city itself. Um, I grew up in a small town called Aurora. And I grew up, you know, with a cottage that my family had, and I grew up playing soccer. So I actually spent pretty much all of my childhood outside. And, you know, I think that nature itself had a really big impact on the artist I've become today. Um, and as you know, like Canada has, I, I may be biased here, but Canada has some of the most beautiful natural beauty, like, especially when you, you head out to the East Coast or the West Coast, like, between the mountains, the Rockies, the lakes, like everything is just so beautiful. And I'm so happy that I've been able to explore the different provinces uh, throughout my lifetime. And I've definitely taken a lot of inspiration from that. Even uh, like, as you know, me being a soccer player, uh, being younger, we would take tournaments like all over Ontario. We would go to different provinces for tournaments, um, even driving out east uh, to the Maritimes. So. I truly was surrounded my entire childhood. And I feel like a lot of that has been taken from then and brought to now. And obviously like in more recent years, uh, being able to travel to different countries outside of Canada has uh, definitely contributed to that as well. What are those other countries that you've been to? I know you've been to quite a few. Yeah, so uh, I mean, besides the States, uh, obviously, um, been to a few places in the States. And I, I think for me, um, I haven't explored enough of, I would say the coastlines, which does have a lot of beautiful locations, but I have been to California a few times and then to New York and down south to Myrtle Beach. So I, I feel like I have a lot more exploring to do in the States specifically, but um, when I was in Florence, I spent as much time as I could spending weekends like outside of Italy going to different countries in Europe so that that was an amazing opportunity I'm sure you know as well because you did study abroad but uh, that was a really great opportunity to go and explore uh, different 
areas and even Italy alone. Oh my gosh. As soon as you go north of the city, uh, sorry, north of Florence, you're getting beautiful, beautiful landscapes, especially along the coast, all the way down to the south. So, you know, I've, I've been really lucky. Like it's, it's been, well, I wish COVID wasn't happening now so I could go and explore some more, but you know, being able to travel and see all this beautiful natural uh, beauty that the world has to offer has, it's been very influential. Now for, for our listeners that might not know our, our personal story, um, you yep. and I actually <laughs> met while we were studying abroad in Florence through mutual friends. Um, can you speak to maybe how that experience might have changed your trajectory in, in art in general? So for me, uh, I think going to Florence, I, I mean, I went there with no expectations. It was just like a brand new year. Uh, it, was, it was very exciting, but I think for me, I really wanted to absorb as much of the culture as I possibly could. Um, my background is Italian, so it was, it was a huge honor for me to be able to study art there. Um, so for me, it's between the food, the, you know, the sports, especially soccer. Um, even just, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like even just being able to go to see Fiorentina play live, like it was just incredible. So the culture alone, I, I really wanted to absorb as much of that as I possibly could. But in terms of the art, I would have to say that that was just, it was incredible. I, I almost don't have the words for it because we were so lucky to be able to study, especially art history, um, where some of the most famous historical pieces actually live. And what was really neat about my program specifically coming from Toronto was um, we had an off-campus program, but our art history professor was an Italian and he, we didn't even have a textbook for our art history class. We would go and physically see the pieces and you know, that you can't ever get that anywhere else. Like that was just a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I think being able to study the pieces face to face in person really, really gave me so much more of an appreciation for, for history and, uh, I don't know, I think that really gave me um, a lot of inspiration moving forward in my art career. So very lucky to have had that experience for sure. Did you find yourself, because I, I found this co completely when I was there, um, I would go out into, you know, take my art history classes, go out into the field, see, see these works in person, and yeah. then come back to the studio and be like, just completely overwhelmed. How am I supposed to create when I'm living around <laughs> all of this phenomenal artwork? It, it just felt a bit overwhelming to me personally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially when you're like surrounded by these masterpieces. Like, how do you even, how do you even start? <laughs> like, you feel like you're almost comparing your work to like Michelangelo's pieces. It's just, it's impossible. But, you know, I, I just, I loved when I could just grab a sketchbook and go and sit down in, uh, I think it was Piazza della Signora, where, um, you know, the, uh, it was the copy of the Michael and, uh, sorry, the David that's outside in the Piazza. Yeah. Like yeah. just sitting there and being able to sketch some of the statues that were around was just like, oh, it's so inspiring. So, you know, taking some of the anatomy studies just from those sketches and applying it to my own work, like, you know, you, you try and make it motivating and not so discouraging because you're so overwhelmed. But yeah, that, that was just awesome. <laughs> I remember so, yeah. even just sitting down in Lacadamia and seeing the David, even though I had seen it previous years before then, but just sitting there, like you could spend all day there because we had passes that were given to us. Mm -hmm. You could spend as much time as you wanted to in there and just being so close to like Michelangelo's work and seeing like the veins pumping through the David, like it is just brilliant. I'm so happy we got to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then yeah. just, just walking around corners and just seeing the architecture yeah. and, you know, oh, I, you know, living next door to the Duomo. What? Yeah, like what? Like, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I'm just going to get a coffee. That's it. And You know? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was just, it was everything, like every corner, even the cobblestones beneath your feet, mm. like it was just every little part of that 
city is just so inspiring. Um, so speaking of the, the inspiration and, and coming back to your studio practice, how do you actually go about starting a drawing? Okay, so um, the first thing I do obviously is finding the proper reference photo to work from. Um, and then for me, materials are so important to my work. Um, I always get a fresh piece of paper and I use one specific type of paper and it's uh, Arches cold press watercolor paper. Um, and I always mask the edges. So I create a border around my piece because I love when a finished piece has a nice clean border. It's just a weird obsession that I have, but it's something that I always do. And uh, then I begin applying the charcoal and it's just take off from there. But that is, uh, for me, materials are everything. It's like a chef finding the best ingredients, like having a beautiful textured piece of paper is just the perfect start to my art piece. <laughs> Do you have a process for actually choosing the, the photo references? Yeah, so um, I think for me, um, having a piece with high contrast is the most important because of the way it's translated into black and white. Uh, having that um, light and shadow is super important for um, like a black and white image. So um, obviously having an image with interesting texture or, you know, um, a composition that I find to be very appealing. So, you know, at the end of the day, it comes to per personal preference whenever I'm working from a reference itself, but contrast is the main thing for me. It, uh, it, it does have to have an interesting light and shadow element. And having, um, you know, studied in the same city with you and seeing mm -hmm. your work from undergrad until now, you have such an eye and such a, a skill for rendering realism and, and rendering the every day. How much of the, these photos that are coming through, are you kind of staying true to that actual photo? And what are those kind of choices of saying, well, I'm going to edit this out or, or keep that in? What, what is that process for you? So it's funny because like I feel like throughout all of my uh, art career and education I've just I've had this obsession with um, being so disciplined to be able to replicate something and you know it's it's come to the point where sometimes I just have to to find a line where I need to just stop <laughs> and I think that allows me to be a little bit more fluid in my work um, so especially for these more current uh, landscape that I'm doing. Um, I, I, I do like stay quite true to the image itself, but I've learned to be able to just come to a point where I stop. And if I don't, I'll spend hours and hours just trying to draw in every little branch to every little tree. And it's just, sometimes it can be too overwhelming. And uh, so I think there's a really healthy balance between how true I stay to the reference itself and to my own um, like fluid approach when it comes to the drawings. So I feel like I've found that health, healthy balance at this point <laughs> because even like since I was young, like it was just like, okay, I have to draw this exactly the way I see it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can just be a little bit too much. <laughs> I, I, uh, I also feel as though the, the space within these drawings is um, it can be expansive, but yet also there, there's such an atmosphere to it. Um, and they mm -hmm. feel really personal based on your scale choices. Um, yep. can, you, can you speak to your reasoning for why you wanna keep that intimate scale? Yeah, so um, when I was in university, I was actually uh, minoring in analog photography, specifically in black and white photography. and that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from for these charcoal renderings. Um, and I feel like they doing these landscapes so intimately, it, it creates this nice interaction between the viewer and the piece. Um, it has that push pull factor. So um, from what I've heard from feedback from galleries is that uh, like a lot of people, they, they first assume that it is a photograph, but because they are of a smaller scale, it draws the attention towards the piece at a closer view. And once people do get a closer view, they can actually see the pencil strokes or they can see, you know, the highlights of the Conte. And, you know, it, it does create this really nice interaction between the piece and the viewer. So, 
that's really why I've, I've worked with this smaller scale. And um, I, I have done larger pieces and I do plan on continuing to do larger pieces, but uh, when it comes to uh, that push pull factor, I really do like the way it works with the smaller intimate pieces. Would you say that you you kind of like that bit of deceit in the, uh, oh, it's a photograph, but <laughs> kind of bring them in? <laughs> oh, of course, of course. I, I do like that. I, I find it to be really interesting to hear what, uh, like how people react when they do see the pieces. Like it's, it's really interesting because obviously everyone has a different opinion and a different point of view. But, you know, when I get someone to, when I get like that ability to be able to pull them in, it's, it's it's really cool. I, I get a sense of accomplishment for that, for, or from that for sure. And um, the the choice to go monochromatic. Um, what what is your reasoning for that? So uh, that definitely goes back to uh, this whole um, like analog photography thing. Um, like I, I I've always really been drawn to the idea of a final piece as a drawing. Um, even throughout university, I found that I just was gravitated more towards drawing itself. I mean, I've, I've dipped my toes in many other mediums, sculpting, painting, you name it. I, I do enjoy a lot of it, but there's just something of, about drawing that I'm so passionate about. Um, and even throughout university, whenever I'd had an instructor for drawing, I just, I felt like I had a better relationship with those professors just because it was something that I'm, I was so interested in. Um, but yeah, when it comes down to my more, re more recent pieces, it's just, I feel like I've taken so much inspiration from black and white film and uh, just trying to be able to translate the characteristics of film into my pieces. I feel like it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey for sure, but that's, that's definitely where a lot of the uh, inspiration comes from. And even just the idea of removing the element of color and having other elements surface because of that. So, you know, creating texture and creating uh, dimension through light and shadow, it's just, it's, uh, it's very fascinating to me. Now, who would you say are, or who would you consider to be some of your greatest influences on your studio practice? Am I allowed to say my mom? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, so I, that may be cliche to say, but uh, my mom has been my biggest support system all throughout my career. So she's an artist herself, and uh, she actually was accepted to my university back in 1981. Uh, she was accepted into OCA, so it was the Ontario College of Art at the time, and she actually still has her original acceptance letter, which was typed out by a typewriter. It's just the coolest thing. <laughs> But she never, she never got to pursue a career in art. So she wasn't able to go to school and, you know, she was living on her own by the time she was 18. And whenever, or sorry, the moment she was able to notice and recognize my talent and my interest towards art, she kind of just guided me all through it. So even from when I was in elementary school, she really encouraged me to go to a fine art high school and then from there it kind of just paved the path throughout the rest of my education and my career and uh, she is just incredible she's so supportive and uh, very inspiring too and the coolest part is that her and I actually ended up going to university together so she had reapplied to OCAD by the time she was 50 and she was accepted into the fine arts program That's and wild. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And when I actually when I was studying in Florence, I got a call from her saying that she had been accepted into the program. So when I got back from my third year starting my fourth year, she was in her first year. So we had one year of school together and it was just amazing. <laughs> that's that's such an experience. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just it's it's amazing. I, I, I love how far she's come and I love how she's been able to finally pursue this dream of hers. And mm -hmm. she's so talented. It's, it's just really unbelievable. And I'm, I'm so yeah. happy to have her. Yeah. <laughs> did she end up uh, finishing her degree? She did. Yeah. She graduated in 2017 and uh, she was featured in the grad exhibition as well as uh, numerous exhibitions to follow after graduating. Uh, her work is very interesting. She does a lot of engraving 
and she uh, co combines literature with uh, with fine arts, and she's just brilliant, so inspiring. That's that, that's amazing. I, I yeah. Love, um, you know, not many not many kids can say that they've went to their parents' graduation. Yeah, uh, exactly. In a really cool kind of cyclical way. Um, yeah. And, and to share that that same experience that has to be so rewarding. Um, you you both oh, went absolutely. through the trenches together. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And speaking of uh, Toronto and Ontario, um, as someone who's never been to Canada, um, can you speak to what the art scene is like up there? Yeah, the the art scene in Toronto is awesome. I, I must say, um, you know, it's there's uh, quite a few pockets throughout the city in Toronto that uh, have like gallery after gallery. And it's it's so nice, like you could spend a day just gallery hopping. And also Toronto has a handful of uh, like pretty large events that take uh, place throughout the year. We have Art Toronto, which probably is the biggest, and uh, Art Toronto showcases galleries throughout the world. And, you know, it's it's such an exciting time of year when that does take place. Unfortunately, obviously with COVID, these things have come to a halt, but mm -hmm. you no, know, the, the art scene in Toronto, it's, it's very diverse. And I find that it's, it's very accepting of like all kinds of different uh, types of artwork and you know, you could spend so much time just exploring the city, a city and seeing it all. And even what I've noticed more recently is uh, the city's been introducing a lot of uh, murals into mm. the architecture. And that's really nice to see because it's bringing a lot of color to the city. And I, I love seeing that. Like it's Toronto's obviously not the biggest city, but for for the art scene, it, it is pretty amazing and I definitely recommend you coming up to Toronto when you can <laughs> oh it's it's on my list it's definitely oh, you better yeah <laughs> a, a couple of years ago I actually um I went to a, a friend's wedding in in Buffalo and so okay, I, <laughs> I, I went up to Niagara Falls and I'm like you know what I'm just going to go and you know maybe walk across the border and then I realized to myself I didn't bring my passport so there was no way to actually kind of do that. Oh no, so close, Jeremy. <laughs> so close, it literally yeah. a stone throws away. <laughs> oh, okay, um, but as soon as you can, let me know. Oh, I totally will, I totally will. Yeah. I'll bring, I'll bring yeah. Schoiler with me. <laughs> yes, bring him back to Toronto. <laughs> um, so you, you spoke to it a little bit before, but you also work in spe special effects makeup. Um, can yeah. You, can you speak to, speak to that? Sure. Um, so after graduating from university, uh, it kind of came to a point in my life where I was like, oh, man, did I just go to school all those years for nothing? Like, I really felt defeated. You know, as you probably know, um, like trying to pursue a career in fine arts, it's challenging. It's very competitive. And, you know, it's really easy to become discouraged. And uh, like, his art itself is such an extension of our emotions. And very easy to be discouraged. So, you know, I spent a lot of time after graduating in 2014 trying to figure out the right path for me. And, uh, you know, I ended up doing some research and I was, uh, I ended up looking into doing special effect makeup. That way I could apply, you know, all the fundamentals that I learned through my fine art uh, education and be able to apply it to something as exciting as special effects makeup, which it is, it's, it's super cool. What a, what a fascinating industry it is. But um, yeah, so anyways, I ended up going to school in Toronto in 2017 for a year program. And uh, that's where I was introduced to the basics of makeup all the way up to prosthetics. And, you know, it was, it was really, really exciting. So over the last few years, um, that's what I've been doing. And then COVID hit. Why did like COVID ruined everything? <laughs> yeah, because the uh, the film industry took a huge beating and uh, work kind of came to a halt. So um, once I stopped working about this time last year, uh, it really, really forced me to try and find something else to do. And that's where this whole uh, charcoal series kind of surfaced. So, you know, in a way it was a blessing, but also it's, uh, yeah, it, it was hard to just stop working. It was really, really hard. One thing that that always fascinates me, um, because you know, so many people they, you know, they're they're 
they get this illusion of the, of the movies and they, they get transported into these different cities that you're supposed to be filming in. But so much filming actually happens in Toronto. It, it just kind of blows my oh, mind yeah. how big the <laughs> film industry actually is. That Canadian is dollar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's incredible. And that was, that was a big part of why I wanted to get into it was because of how massive the film industry is here. There are so many opportunities. And even uh, with Netflix doing filming here as well, like it's just, it's amazing. Like the Canadian dollar really is, it's, it's great. <laughs> it has been very beneficial. So uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see, like they do a lot of New York scenes here, like a lot of Chicago scenes, like, you know, trying to make it look like these massive cities in the state. So Toronto has it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I want to go back to Florence a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I just want to ask kind of what is one memory from living in Florence? Um, kind of, you know, you experienced all this art, but outside of art, what is just one memory from Florence that just kind of lives in your head rent free? Uh, you know, when I read the question, I was like, oh, there are so many memories. How can I possibly pinpoint one? But uh, there was there was one night in particular, which I will never, ever forget. And uh, it was at the beginning of December. And it was the time of year when there weren't, I, I don't want to say there weren't any tourists, but it seemed like there, there really weren't many tourists at all. And that was a really nice thing to experience in Florence because, you know, we had been there in, I think we, were, we got there at the end of August and it was kind of the end of the peak season for tourism. And, you know, there were some days where you couldn't even walk through some of the piazzas because there was just so many people. And I found it hard to really just enjoy some of the architecture around us. And there was one night in December, uh, me and my roommates decided to go for a walk and it was pretty late at night. And uh, that particular night, there was this like blanket of fog over the city and it was just wild to see. And we just, we went for a really nice walk, uh, walk all the way down to um, the Arno. And, you know, having the city illuminated by all the Christmas lights that were covering all the buildings. And then even seeing uh, like the Christmas tree that was lit up by the, du uh, the Duomo. It was just, I don't know, there was something in particular about that night that just seemed so eerie almost disturbing but also so peaceful and beautiful it was just I'll never get that night out of my head it was just the most incredible experience and there was not a soul walking around the city it, it, I felt like we were the only people in the world like it was just a ghost town and it was it was unbelievable I'm really happy I was able to experience that <laughs> I think it's interesting that you, you chose that memory because yeah. you can see that memory almost in a lot of your drawings yes. um, that are coming through in your studio practice. Yeah, um, there, absolutely. It's such an atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and, and you spoke a little bit to kind of the, 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 the provoking of, of psychological space and, and kind of mm -hmm. um, these spaces within, within the almost metaphor of the landscape. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I, I think for me, like, you know, it, it draws a lot on the preservation of land itself and how, you know, it's just there's such an emotional co connection to the world that we have. And, you know, when I do these, these drawings, I feel like between the clouds and the water and the reflection, like it really does stir up all of these emotions. It's almost, there's almost like a, a balance between and negative and positive. And I feel like that says a lot, not just of me as an artist, but also about, you know, the world's mental state of being. Like it's, you know, it, it, there's this constant contrast between good and bad. And, you know, even touching base on mental illness itself. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's, I, I've made it a goal of mine to really represent these landscapes, not as just the still landscape, but something that is very emotional. And uh, yeah, I, I think that says a lot about our environment alone, because, you know, if we keep going the direction that we're going in, it's, it's going to cause mass destruction. And I feel like there's a bit of a sense of that. Although the, the images I create, I, I try to make them beautiful, but there is that sense of 
negative and urgency. So yeah, that's that's definitely a big part of the theme that I work around. I love that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's so relatable for for everyone. At, at yeah, this point. especially uh, nowadays. Really, mm-hmm. yeah. It's just, you know, this year in particular, it's been really destructive, like for people's mental health, especially. And it's just really important that we recognize that. On a um, on a lighter note. Um, yes. <laughs> that so... got dark. <laughs> um, outside of the kind of confines of Italian art, you know, because we, we, we both studied in, in Florence and we got to see all these great masterworks in, in, in Italy and, and witness them firsthand. Um, yeah. What is one piece of art that you have to see in person before you die? Oh, um, that's a really hard, to, a hard answer for me to give because I have been so lucky that I've been able to see the pieces that I've wanted to cross off my bucket list. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like from seeing pieces in Italy specifically, but also being able to travel to the Louvre in France and like being in Spain and trying to pinpoint one specific piece is just, it's really hard for me to say because I've seen them. I've really seen them. For me, La Pieta, by Michelangelo was the one piece that I I needed to see before I died and I've mm-hmm. I've been so lucky that I could see it in the flesh and it it like practically brought tears to my eyes like I just that was the one piece I needed to see and you know there now there's actually some contemporary artist work that I I do want to see um there's uh an artist from the states and I think before I die I definitely want to be able to check out one of her pieces because they relate to mine in some ways Zaria Foreman she does these incredible uh uh drawings they're pastel drawings of um icebergs of glaciers I'm sure you've seen her work I think I have seen them yeah yeah yeah. her so she actually works in large scale Mm -hmm. and her primary focus is on climate change and, uh, you know, to see how far a female artist has come is really inspiring to me, but also her pieces themselves, I just, oh, they move me. Like, it is just unbelievable. Um, and she works in such, like, massive scale as well. And I think being able to physically be in front of one of her pieces would just be life-changing. And uh, she's actually been featured in National Geographic. She's been invited to travel to the North Pole with NASA. Like, oh my God, <laughs> that That's is just wild. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So for me, like, you know, I, I've been very, very blessed and lucky enough to say that I've seen the historical masterpieces that I've always wanted to see. And I've been able to mark those off my bucket list. But now I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, okay, these are some like, very, very successful female artists who I just, you know, they create such beautiful work. And I would love to be able to see her work in particular. Like it is just, it's unbelievable. So yes, there's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so over the the span of your career, I'm sure you've, you've had a bunch of advice given to you. Um, yeah. What is one piece of advice that that still resonates with you today? Um, that that's just a really great piece of advice that you've received. And what is one piece of advice that you would like to pass on to an up and coming generation of creatives? Uh, so for me personally, I think the this might sound smaller than you expect, but for me, it's material. So. I, I, I think in the last year, I've been told by somebody who said, you know what, if you put the money and attention into your good quality materials, it'll translate your pieces and it'll, you know, make the world difference. And for me, that was actually such a huge, you know, crossroad. Like I, I needed to just invest more time and more money into something that would be so beneficial in the end. Mm-hmm. And I know that you know, it may not seem that inspiring, but for me, that was just really something that I I needed to hear because my God, it makes such a big difference. But uh, in terms of advice that I would give to 
you know, an up and coming creative from a younger generation. It's, you know, I could say a few things, but really it's just, if you're passionate about something, don't let someone try and steer you away from that. Like it's, it's so important that you just stick to something that you love and just, you know, take it to the stars. Like you just got to stick with it and keep going because, you know, we kind of live in a world right now where we take so much inspiration from you know, like Instagram, from social media, and it's so easy to get steered away from something that you love and it's so easy to get distracted and I just feel like it's so important to stay true like true to yourself and just follow through with something that you're passionate about and even in a time like right now like we we need more creative we need more artwork we need more real in the world because there's so much fake <laughs> So true. So true. Yeah. So for someone who's really young and looking for advice, just just stay true to yourself. Keep practicing. You know, stick to your passion. And I think that is kind of the the perfect place to to wrap this up. Um, Yeah. So, uh, Catherine, if people are looking for your work, where might they be able to find it? Perfect. So I do have a personal website for my artwork. It's uh, just catherinekirchie.com. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is katherinekirchie.art. And uh, my work is currently being featured at uh, Susan Ely Fine Arts Gallery in Hudson, New York. I have six pieces there. And uh, the show will be on for the next week. Yeah. <laughs> great, great, Catherine. It was, it was amazing catching up. And I loved seeing you. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. If you guys haven't seen her work yet make sure you go to her website make sure you check it out if you're in new york and um thank you all so much for watching and make sure you tune in next week all right i will see you later thank you